Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Arvind Lyman Hanavi. Let's take the next 30 minutes and continue looking at these deeply important passages as we entertain this idea, is God Trinity? Is God unity? Is God, how many parts are there to God, right? So we are working from this idea that biblicalunitarianism.com takes the position that God is unity, that he's numerically one, that there's only one of him being wise, and therefore there's only one of him person wise. There are no three persons, etc., etc. That's the biblical Unitarian or non Trinitarian perspective that we're contrasting using the Trinitarian model that I hold to myself. I'm a Messianic Jew. I believe in the Trinity just like Orthodox Christianity believes in. I use the word Orthodox with a small o. I'm not an Orthodox Greek Orthodox believer or anything like that. I use the word Orthodox in the sense of original biblical. Trinitarianism. So we've got Deuteronomy 6 pulled up in front of us. Let me read the verses for you once again. Moses writes, verse 6, oops, let's back up to verse 4. There we go. Moses writes, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So how many of God is there? Moses says one. Now, the Hebrew says, let me show it to you. The Hebrew says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Question. How many are there in the Hebrew? The answer, echad. God is echad. But what does the word echad mean? Let's jump into it and find out. If we pull this passage up in different versions, like I've done in the past, we can see in the Hebrew, echad means one. In the Greek, es, esti, is the Greek there, is one or exists as one. What we're finding is that most naturally, what the verse is telling us is that there is one God, there's one God alone. Listen up, Israel. There's only one God, and he alone is the one true God. You are to serve him alone. You are to love him, right? The verse goes on to talk about loving him with all your heart and your soul, your might, etc., etc. You shall not divide your loyalty between God and other so-called gods or other beliefs in God, other deities that are recognized as God or referred to as gods by other people groups. In reality, God is telling Israel there's only one God. Here's where it gets a little challenging. Yes, there's only one God. Monotheists affirm one God. Biblical Unitarians affirm one God. Trinitarians affirm one God. However, the verse does not say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one person. The context demands that the Lord alone is one God, that he alone is the unique God, the single God that truly exists. Here in Israel, the Lord our God, there is only one. There's only one true God, the Lord alone, the Lord, the unique one. He alone is the one true God. And yet, as we encounter the historical occurrences of the New Testament times, first century when Yeshua lived, and the subsequent writings that came afterwards, the Apostolic Scriptures, a.k.a. the New Testament, we then begin to realize that this one God is diverse and that he came to us in the person of Yeshua, the human being. The incarnation reveals to us that God is complex in his nature. He's one God, and yet he's three persons. There's Father, there's Son, there's Holy Spirit. Father is the source. The Son is He who was eternally begotten from the Father. And the Spirit is He who is eternally proceeds from the Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're talking about three persons, not three gods. Like James White is fond of saying, a popular Trinitarian author, one what and three who's. Now, biblical Unitarianism is going to object. So, What we're looking at, let me jump into where we left off last week. What we're talking about is that God is one, echad, and yet he's not yachid. So let's look at this. The 13 principles of Jewish faith according to rabbinic Judaism, right? We got 13 principles of Jewish faith. Maimonides, the great codifier of Jewish Torah law, Jewish philosophy, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, otherwise known as Maimonides or the Rambam, Let's pick up this brief look at what Maimonides taught the Jewish people and continues to have impact on the Jewish people down through today as seen through the lens of a very well 
resourced website by the name of Chabad.org. This is a rabbinic Jewish source. They are not Christian. They do not believe in a Trinitarian God. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So listen up. The Rambam compiled what is what he or Maimonides compiled what is referred to as the the Shlosha Asar Ikarim, the thirteen fundamental principles of the Jewish faith, as derived from the Torah. Right. Let me see if I can give me a second. I might just blow that up absurdly large. No, that doesn't work for me. We're gonna leave it at that. And this, these thirteen principles are preserved for us in his writings. Let me just jump right into them and notice. What he says in ver in not in verse in uh in point number two. Well, let me back up. Point number one, he says, I believe with a perfect faith. That's how it reads out of the Hebrew, but in the English it translates says, We believe in the existence of the creator who is perfect in every manner of existence and is the primary cause of all that exists. By the way, we Christians would primarily believe in that as well. Some of these are straight out of the Bible, so we don't have any problem with them. But look at point number two. We believe that the the belief in God's absolute and unparalleled unity. <clears throat> and in the English, it simply says unity. Right. But if we look at this in a different reference, a different source, let me turn to a Hebrew for Christians.com, the word, the number four. And this is a Christian source, but it's talking about the same 13 principles, the Shlosha Asar Ikarim, the 13 principles of the Jewish faith. And when we drop back down, it's point number two, God is unique in one. So let me click on that. And this is the second principle. And if you scroll down, we can see, we can see the English and we can see the Hebrew. I believe with a complete faith that the creator, blessed, he, blessed be his name, he is unique in his likeness he is unique in his likeness there's no and there is no let's try that again i believe with complete faith that the creator blessed blessed is his name he is unique and there is no uniqueness like his so we're talking about unique he is unique what does it mean he's unique the hebrew has the word yahid when it says he is unique I can't highlight it because this website doesn't allow me to highlight, but I'll bring it up in a different version here for you to see. So Maimonides uses this word, not echad, but this word yachid. Let's bring up um, another source. Yachid. You can see the two words there on my screen. Yachid would be transliterated Y-A-C-H-I-D. Comparatively, the word echad would be transliterated as E-C-H-A-D. So echad versus yachid, two different words. So Maimonides says that God is yachid, right? This word yachid, Y-A-C-H-I-D, Strong's number 3173. It is a biblical word. Let's blow that part up for you. Yachid, the adjective, substant, uh, substantive, yachid, only, only one, solitary, and this word can be translated as lonely, one child, only, only son. We see this word in use in, for instance, Genesis, let me scroll to it here. Genesis 22, 2, when God tells Abraham to take your son, your only son whom you love, speaking of Isaac, this is where God is commanding Abraham to go up to the mountain and to sacrifice his son, right? To slay his son until the angel of the Lord stops him. But wait a minute. At this point in time, Abraham has two sons, right? He has Ishmael, who's the older, firstborn, and he has Isaac, who's the younger, the secondborn. However, only one of Abraham's sons was born through Sarah. The other came through Hagar, which means the father is the same, but the mothers are different. Another significant difference is that Hagar was born through natural means, nothing supernatural about it. Abraham slept, slept with Hagar, and they produced offspring. His name was Ishmael. Nothing unusual about that, right? Abraham's body was working, and Hagar's body was in perfect working condition. However, when it came to Ishmael, I'm sorry, when it came to Isaac and Sarah, Abraham's wife, not his handmaiden, but his wife. Sarah's body was already past childbearing age. Likewise, so was Abraham's. What happened? They got together and supernaturally, they had a child named Isaac. 
And thus, Isaac is the miracle baby. And so when God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, bincha et yechidcha, asher ahavta, take your son, your, and I'll highlight it this time, your only son, yechidcha, He's saying, your unique son, your only son, contextually, according to a certain set of conditions. The context being, your only son by Sarah, your only son by miracle, your only son by old age, etc., etc. So, it doesn't mean your only physical son. Abraham had two. But it means your unique son, according to a certain set of conditions. So, why am I bringing up this difference? Why are we highlighting this? Let's read this little chart here and you'll explain why. I pulled this from a, a, a just a web source. You can Google search this. Trinity, oneness in unity, not in number. Yahid versus Echad. Here was Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Echad, right? Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. It does not say, listen very closely, biblical Unitarian, it does not say, here was Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is unique and only one, numerically one, only one person, i.e. The Hebrew does not read, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Yahid. Right? Let's go back and look again. Make sure I'm checking. Make sure I got it right. Oops. Didn't want that. We want this. Right? What does it say? Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai, and I'll highlight it for you, Adonai Echad. It does not say Adonai Yahid. I'll show you the simple form so you can follow along. It does not say Adonai Yahid. That's not what the Shema says. Which means Rashi is teaching something that's not entirely biblical according to what text we find in the Bible. Look at this chart again. Yahid versus Echad, the most important verse Jews memorized in the Bible, was Deuteronomy 6.4. Here is Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one, the Hebrew being Echad. There are a few words in Hebrew that the Holy Spirit could have used a word, the, the Holy Spirit could have used a word that has one exclusive meaning, the numeric solitary oneness of God, Yahid or bad. Oddly enough that it means bad there. But the point I'm trying to make is that God didn't tell the Holy or the Holy Spirit and God the Father didn't write, didn't tell Moshe to write, Heroes are the Lord of God, the Lord is Yahid. Instead, the Holy Spirit chose to use the Hebrew word Echad, which is used most often as a unified one and sometimes as numeric oneness. For example, when God said in Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh, Basar Echad, it's the same word for one that was used in Deuteronomy 6.4. And then in closing, this is most troubling for Jews and anti-Trinitarians, since the word Yahid, the main Hebrew word for solitary oneness, is never used in reference to God. And that, indeed, is factual. If you look up the word Yahid, let's go back to this Strong's Concordance, and I go over to the English Concordance usage, shows up in Genesis 2, or 22, uh, a few different times when God's talking with Abraham, shows up in the book of Judges, shows up in the book of Psalms, right? And the book of Psalms, Psalm, Proverbs, Jeremiah, Amos, Zechariah, and that's it. And none of those cases has it talking about God being Yahid. All of those are just talking about aspects or nouns or objects that are uniquely singular in their existence, like from context. Abraham had two physical sons, but only one of them was unique. One of them was Yahid, numerically one, in the sense that one came from Sarah, his wife. Hey, Abraham, how many wives do you, um, how many sons do you have from Sarah at this point? Abraham would say, I have Yahid, I have only one. Numerically one, God, there's only one son that came from Sarah. Okay, that's the one I want you to take up to the mountain and sacrifice. So the English loses us sometimes. Take your son, your only son, Yahid, that one. Yeah. Okay. So why are we bringing this up? Again, biblical Unitarianism wants us to believe somehow that God is numerically one, that he cannot be three persons. But we're finding over and over again that this is simply not the case. Let's jump into some commentaries, and then we will finish out by looking at some verses. I don't know how far I'll get into this commentary. This first one is from 
Tim Haig. I think I have two from Tim Haig. But this first one talks about this idea of Echad and Yahid again. Let me blow that up a little bit for us. This is from one of his Torah parasha commentaries that you can buy. It's not available for... Well, I think it is available for free online. I, I, I need to do some looking again, but I, I purchased this one myself. But let's, here's, what, here's what Tim has to say about the Yahid and Echad discussion that we've just been having. Quote, The declaration of God's character continues with the statement, Adonai is one. So Tim is commenting on the Shema passage that we're looking at now. Ramban explained to us in his interpretation of the word Echad, when in his 13 principles he exchanged the word Echad with Yahid, singular. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is singular. Or, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is numerically one. That's what Maimonides is trying to explain to Jewish people. Again, this is in line with their rejection of Trinity. This is in line with their rejection of Messiah as as the incarnate God. Tim continues, In reaction to the Christian doctrine of a triunity, which Rambam misunderstood to mean three gods, he emphasized rather the singularity of God's being. Let me stop and interject. If we're dealing with the topic of are there one God or are there three gods, then absolutely we affirm that there is only one God. We Trinitarians, we Christians, stand on the same side as rabbinic Jews, as national Israel, that there is only one God. We don't affirm that there are three gods. That is absolute heresy that there would be three gods. Understand what I'm saying? So, make sure you have your language accurate. Make sure you understand the context when you're talking with people about Trinity. If they ask you to believe in Trinity and you say yes and they shake their head in in disbelief and disgust and walk away, you might want to ask them what part of Trinity is too hard to understand. What part of it is heretical? What part of it is is non-biblical? If they say, well, Trinity means three gods, or a three-headed god, or one god with three masks, or three modes, or something else like that, well, then politely correct them, okay? So begin to articulate your Trinity accurately. That's why we're having these studies on the issues of Trinity, discussions on the issues of Trinity, and these debates between Unitarians and Trinitarians, because we're trying to disambiguate the language. We're trying to make things plain. We're trying to avoid ambiguity and equivocation and things like that. So back to Tim Haig. So Rambam Rambam is utilizing or highlighting or emphasizing the oneness of God uh, as against to a supposed three-headed God or three gods. So for that effort, I would applaud Rambam, Rambam if that's what he means. However, listen that what Tim Haig says, but I'm convinced that singularity is not the primary use of the word achad in our passage, meaning... Uh, Again, Rambam was probably writing in reaction against not just Christians saying that God is three, but some Christians not articulating that God is really one and yet three persons. So maybe Rambam didn't really understand Trinity either. I'm I'm quite certain he, he didn't. And yet, Tim Haig says, I'm convinced that singularity is not the primary issue of the word Echad in our passage. Tim continues, it is true that the word can have the sense of unity, right? Genesis 2.24. And I agree with that. Most Messianics would try to highlight that aspect. Hey, Echad means unity, right? Two people, man, woman, come together, Basad and Echad, one flesh. And so just like that, God has Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They all come together, one God. Yes, this is true. But when we're looking just at the Shema itself, is that what God was emphasizing? Is God trying to explain to us, hey, Israel, listen up. I'm one, yet three, yet one. Or was there something more in the passage or more uh, what we might say, foundational in the passage that God was trying to get get across. So listen to what Tim says. It's true that the words can have the sense of unity, like in Genesis, but again, while this may have some bearing upon our text, this is Tim talking. He says, I don't think it is the primary meaning here. Rather, the context would emphasize that the meaning of Echad here is unique. That is, there's no other God, and therefore there's no compulsion to divide one's loyalty, one's service, and worship with any other God. 